weekly Wednesday webinar series. Um, if you're getting your Con Ed, uh, make sure to watch the entire session. Uh, a survey will pop up right when we close out. The same survey will be emailed to you uh, one hour after the event. Please don't take it twice, but please take one of them. Even if you don't need CEUs, we definitely appreciate any and all feedback on how we can do better, so make sure to take that survey. Um, uh, coming up next week, we are taking a break, so obviously uh, have a, a fantastic Thanksgiving. Um, and then the following week, we're going to be talking about using on-bill financing to break down existing uh, barriers to home energy upgrades. And then um, on the 18th, a new study has come out from Freddie Mac, so we're excited to have them back to talk about how HERS-rated homes sell for more compared to non-rated homes. Uh, and then real excited on the 10th, uh, instead of doing a webinar that week, we're going to have an all-day session. We'd love for you to come out to Grand Rapids and join us and hang out in person, but we understand that might be a long way to go. So you can also call in online to this all-day Lead for Homes workshop where we're going to focus on Lead B4. Um, if you uh, uh, want to see greener and better homes for all, support our mission. If you're tired of uh, registering for, um, uh, uh, if you're tired of uh, registering for um, every course and want to get discounts on paid courses, uh, sign up to become a member and, and um, uh, check that out on our website there at uh, become a member. All right, so huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, T-Stud. Uh, what is T-Stud? T-Stud is a game-changing technology. The T-Stud solves the number one nemesis of construction industry, how to cost-effectively stop the transfer of heat energy through the walls. Uh, T-Stud is a thermally broken insulated wall stud assembly for use in exterior walls and party walls. The T-Stud is an engineered building product that uses two lumber members, an internal truss system, and a froth in place closed cell foam. It has a global warming potential of less than one, it is EPA compliant for 2020. T-Stud provides a 99% complete thermal break through the wall assembly. With just one product, the T-Stud raises the bar on six major construction concerns, thermal breaks, structural strength, wind load, sound transmission, fire life safety, mold, and termites. The T-Stud isn't complicated. It's quite easy to replace traditional two-by lumber with the T-Stud with little to no additional training. Plus, it can be used as studs, jack studs, king studs, sills, cripples, headers, top and bottom plates, uh, and there might be some uh, rebates available to pick up uh, from your local utility. Uh, better yet, go naked. Uh, introducing the brand new Bare Naked Stud. Uh, this is approved for up to uh, two stories. And this can be filled with your choice of insulation. It doesn't just have to be spray foam. Uh, you can use cellulose, fiberglass, mineral wool, and I believe you could even use horsehair if you'd like to. So check that out uh, as well. And uh, we're excited to announce that T-Set is a 2019 Green Builder Media Sustainability Award winner for structural ingenuity. Make sure to go check them out over at uh, tstud.com today. And thanks to our secondary sponsor, this session is brought to you by Serve2 Smart Ventilation System. With a standard ERV or HRV, you get a constant low airflow rate with no relation to actual indoor air quality or occupancy. Uh, and so with the Serve 2, you get smart ventilation that detects pollution, uh, integrated with a heat pump system for maximum comfort uh, and energy efficiency. Go to buildequinox.com to check out the Serve 2. All right, well, welcome everyone to Sealing the Deal, Innovations in Air Sealing. This course is approved for a number of continuing education units, lead AP homes being one of them, BPI uh, as well. Uh, AIA, Health, Welfare, and Safety, HSW, may make it applicable for your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, and we're also excited to uh, have CAUs here from the uh, Passive House Institute US uh, as well. I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Um, and this whole idea here is about um, the innovations uh, that are progressing uh, to reduce air loss and air entry into uh, our homes, buildings, whether they're new uh, construction or existing, especially, you know, us here up in cold weather climates, uh, very important. 
Um, so our main speaker today is going to be uh, Paul Springer. He is the business manager for Aero Barrier, and we're going to have a guest star at the end, uh, adding to the conversation, Mark Cryer. He sits on our home evaluation committee as a GHI member, and he is the general manager of Aero Barrier at West Michigan. Uh, so with that, Paul, welcome, and please take it away. Well, hold on one second for me. I'm going to switch screens. It looks like you're seeing the wrong screen. <clears throat> All right, better. So, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, or if you're coming in from the West Coast, good morning. Um, as Brett said, my name is Paul Springer. I'm the National Director for Aero Barrier. Um, and just want to walk through air sealing in general and how aerosol air sealing is is changing the way we build homes today. Um, in general, the goal of this is just to understand how air sealing is the foundation to a high performance building. Um, to get started, obviously this is a new technology, right? Um, but the idea of aerosol sealing um, systems is not necessarily new. There was actually um, inventions back to 1994. Our companies, the technology based in our company started around a duct sealing technology that was um, invented over 20 years ago. So we've taken that technology and now expanded it to the entire home. Um, so while it may seem new to the market, the general principles and foundation of the technology aren't really all that new. Um, <clears throat> and as we work through this, you know, there's really four building science control layers, one of which we can control, which is airflow, right? Uh, when we start talking about air sealing, but these are really in um, in rank order as far as how you should approach them. Obviously, bulk water is the biggest control layer that you need to be concerned about first. That bulk water has the potential to have um, increased and accelerated um, negative impacts on a building. Um, so bulk water should be the first point of interest when you're designing a building or bulk water management. But closely behind that should be airflow and air sealing. Um, airflow has, um, it can impact the next two when it comes to thermal control and moisture vapor control. Um, but outside of bulk water management, airflow is the next biggest thing that you need to be thinking of when you start designing a building as it relates to risk management. And that's really what we're gonna get into today. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits when you start thinking about reduced air leakage. A lot of people, you know, would typically relate this to energy savings on heating and cooling cost, but there's actually a lot more involved than just that, right? You start talking about a more comfortable home, diminished outside noise, defend against insects, improve indoor air quality, right? All those are great things for the occupants. Um, when we start talking about for the builder, um, reduced air leakage helps prevent moisture from entering the wall system right? This, just by air sealing and help controlling moisture um, entering and exiting the wall system, it helps with building durability. It helps the product perform in the way it's supposed to. And it's really one of the things that we're going to focus on here for the next couple of slides, because all the other things you kind of expect or are pretty, I, I would say, table stakes when you start talking about air sealing. But when you start talking about moisture in the wall system, it's not just about bulk water. Um, there is moisture that is moving as vapor through the air um, that can impact that system. So you've probably seen this slide or this graphic before. When you think of a, a four by eight sheet of gypsum, there's going to be some water that automatic that just naturally goes through that through diffusion. If you take that exact same sheet of gypsum and you add just a one inch hole, one square inch hole of air leakage. That goes from a third a quart of water to 30 quarts of water in a month time, right? So when you start thinking about water management, um, air sealing is a big piece of that, that puzzle. If you're letting air leak into your wall systems or into your building, you're also letting water vapor in as well. So you know, when you think about a one square inch hole, what does that equate to when it's three ACH based on the building that you're looking at? What if it's five ACH based on the local code? right? That 30 quarts of water 
becomes an enormous amount in a month's time. And it's something that we really need to be aware of and thinking through as we design our structures and as we think through, you know, again, bulk water management should be number one, but close behind it should be air sealing and how you control air movement through the building. Because as you can see from this chart, while it may not be bulk water, there's a lot of water that's going to enter the wall system or in, enter the building through air leakage. So what are some of the challenges with air leakage, right? Why aren't more people doing this in a more meaningful way? When you think about air leakage, you know, there's a lot of trades that are involved. We have the framer, the plumber, the insulator, the electrician, the HVAC contractor, and not necessarily, I mean, we're starting to see more on the insulation side of the business that there's some accountability to air sealing. But if you have a blower door requirement of three ACH50 or one ACH50 and you don't meet it, there's not necessarily one trade that you can go point the finger to and say, hey, we missed here or this wasn't done correctly. Um, you know, there's just a lot of people that are involved in creating an airtight envelope. On top of that, there are many materials that are involved, right? Caulks, foams, tapes, gaskets, membranes. And the question becomes, as you're designing the building and constructing the building, what's the right combination and how do they interact with each other in a way that allows you to achieve the results that you're looking for? And the last or the other one here is obviously houses are not getting simpler, right? Architecture and the houses that we're, bu we're building are becoming more complex with crazy roof lines, um, punch out different um, variations of the wall system. So the question becomes, where do you seal and how do you seal it? Um, it's not becoming any easier to air seal a structure based on the current architecture that we're seeing in the marketplace. And the last two are really the big drivers to why this is important. Today with standard practices, there's a lot of unpredictable results. Although you're trying to achieve three ACH to get to code um, or whatever your target may be, you don't know what you're gonna get till the end of that process and you don't know where the failures may be until you do a blower door. Um, on top of that, getting it right matters. When we say air sealing is the foundation to a high performance home or high performance structure, the air leakage is going to impact your MEP. It's going to impact your mechanical system. It may impact the insulation that you put in the wall system, right? When you start thinking about fiberglass or, poor, or blown in insulation, having air moving through that insulation actually will deteriorate, deteriorate the R value. So when we start building or designing our buildings with a set ACH in mind, getting it right matters because when you look at the, the home as a system, other things are going to be impacted or may not perform as expected if the leakage is more than expected. On top of that, we're looking at IECC codes changing, right? In, very, in no states are IECC codes going backwards. We're going to continue to see these codes progress in a meaningful way. And then on top of that, if you're taking it a step further and looking at Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready, or even Passive House, right? Air tightness is becoming a key component. Blower door testing is becoming a key component, not only for the high performance homes, but in our standard IECC um, requirements. So things are starting to change there as well. And the last piece of this that you should really be aware of is consumers care. The customers that you're working with are becoming more and more educated than they've ever been. While a lot of people may be familiar with Zero Energy Ready or LEED or Passive House or Energy Star, you know, things like Well Standard or Living Building Challenge are becoming more prevalent because it's available on the internet. Your customers are gonna ask for it. Um, you know, the path forward into the marketplace is a lot of these different certifications. So understanding them and you know, at the end of the day, air sealing is the foundation of each one of these certifications and is a piece of each one of these certifications. So not only is there the reason to do it from a build environment and the, the project that you're building, but your, your certifications and things like that are also starting to move towards and requiring blower door and air sealing. So we've talked a lot about why air sealing is important and why it matters. And really what we're talking about today is this game changing solution that we believe is in the market that offers consistently tighter building envelopes that provides verified and documented results of the process throughout the process. It's a single step process. And at the end of the day, it's gonna save time, money and labor. Um, so what I would like to do is just make sure everybody's familiar with the technology and how it works. Um, so we'll run through a couple slides of 
you know, what does it look like and how does it work? Um, and then we'll kind of move on from there. So when we start looking at aerosolizing a space, um, the prep for, for this process is key. The technology is great because it doesn't discriminate. It's going to seal a leak if there's a leak. The problem with that is, is you don't want to seal things that aren't expected to be sealed. So most of the prep that we do when we start a project is sealing the designed openings. Is that a supply and return? That may be a bathroom vent, or maybe there's a drain that doesn't have water in the trap yet. So working through the process at rough in or drywall stage, there's very minimal prep. No vertical surfaces have to be protected when you apply using the aerosol air sealing. Um, it doesn't create a film over everything. It doesn't create a mess over everything. So the only things we're looking to protect are designed openings and finished horizontal surfaces that are going to be exposed when the occupant or when the, the owner take, takes occupancy of the space. So very little prep is, is required as we get into the construction process, again, at rough end or first coat of drywall mud. And you can see through the pictures here, we put um, up to 16 nozzles throughout the house, up to 100 feet away from the system. Depending on the size of the structure, depending on the layout of the structure, we can use as little as two and as many as 16 nozzles to effectively seal that building envelope. Once we feel good about the prep, we'll run an initial blower door. And as you can see in the picture in the bottom right, that's a standard Minneapolis blower door. So we use the same blower door that your third-party energy raters or HERS raters are going to use in the final blower door test. Um, but we'll ramp that blower door up and we'll, we'll make sure we're at a good starting point as far as pre-leakage before we run the system. Once we feel good about where we're starting, we'll, run, we'll start up the system and we'll start to inject the sealant. Like I said, we can, in, we can put nozzles throughout the house however we see fit based on the structure that we're sealing. Um, the big thing to point out is in the bottom right picture there, you see one of the technicians on the computer. That computer is controlling the entire process. Um, it's controlling the temperature. It's controlling the humidity. It's controlling the pressure on the blower, that the blower door is putting on the house. Um, it's creating or controlling the amount of sealant being injected, and it's also getting a blower door reading every 90 seconds. So essentially in real time, that computer can tell the technician what level of envelope leakage has been achieved, and once the target is hit, you turn it off. There's no wasted time, no wasted labor, no wasted material, and the target has been reached based on what that building was designed to, to reach. Um, so it really takes the guesswork out of sealing the building envelope. You don't have to wait till the end or um, till later in the build process to really understand what the building leakage is. You're going to get a readout in real time that that provides that information for you. So like I said, the, the software really controls everything. Um, the technicians are there to do, as, do what the software is informing them to do um, and to manage the system itself. Um, once the process is done, you get a, a certificate that looks like the one on the right that gives you the results of the seal. So it'll show you pre-leakage, it'll show you post-leakage, and it'll show you the amount of time it took to achieve the results that you're looking for. So whether you're doing a, a large apartment project or a single family detached unit, each unit that you seal or that is sealed would get the certificate of completion showing the results of that, that um, the work that was done. <clears throat> to give you an idea of what this looks like, again, the one thing to reiterate is this isn't making a mess over the entire structure. It's only adhering to where air is leaving the building envelope. So when we run our system, we put positive pressure on that structure using the blower door. Um, we try to get up to 100 pascals. Um, once we get up to 100 pascals, the air in that structure is trying to find ways to escape. Right? It, it has to relieve the pressure. The air is pretty much self-identifying the leaks. When we aerosolize our sealant, those sealant particles are about 10 microns. So they're the size of a human hair. Um, they will actually float or stay suspended in air at that pressure created by the blower door. At that point, we use air as our method of transport, and it carries the sealant particles to wherever the air is leaking out of the building envelope. And as it reaches that pressure plane where it changes from positive pressure to a different pressure that's outside of the building envelope, those sealant particles start to build on each other. 
And as you can see from the pictures, it only those sealant particles only collect where the air is exiting the pressurized space. It's not collecting on the wood. It's not collecting on the drywall. It's only collecting where air is moving through leakage in that envelope. The best picture I can give you is this one here, where on the left is a pre-seal picture, and on the right is post-seal. So again, it's not creating a mess over everything. It's creating a nice clean seal there around the junction box. If you look at the back of that junction box, you can see that where the punch out was used around the wires, it is also sealed. But if you look at the punch out next to that, the one that wasn't used is also sealed. Um, when I say, when I mentioned earlier, the sealant doesn't discriminate. If there's a leakage, if there's leakage or a leak in the building envelope that is identified by the system, it's going to seal it. So that's why our prep is as important as it is, because we're going to seal every leak in that structure up to half an inch um, with our system. So anything that's not to be sealed does need to be protected. <clears throat> so we get a lot of questions on what's a sealant, right? You're, you're aerosolizing a sealant into the air. Is it, is it going to cause harm? Um, is there a problem with that? So the X1 sealant that we use in our system is a waterborne acrylic. When you start thinking about adhesives and caulks in the building industry, a lot of those are solvent-based. Um, our sealant is actually water-based. So it, it adds a little bit of um, safety and, and health to it just from the onset. But the sealant itself is Green Guard Gold certified as well. And what that really means is it's, it's safe to be used in hospitals and uh, in schools. And obviously, occupants of those facilities are a little bit more susceptible to airborne pests or airborne pesticides or airborne uh, things that could impact them in a negative way. So the fact that we can spray and be applied in those applications um, is another way that we're showing that it is safe for the build environment and, and is safe to be used in the home. Um, the sealant itself is inert. There is no chemical reaction occurring when a seal is created. Um, so there's no need to, there's no off gassing. There's no long term um, concern for exposure from the sealant being injected. Um, what it typically takes is after the seal is complete, um, within 30 minutes, it's safe for someone to re enter that space without P any PPE. So really, by the time the, the, the equipment is removed and everything is taken down, it's safe to reenter that space and for other subs to reenter that space and continue doing work. Um, and lastly, it meets all the ASTM requirements that you would expect for fi fire, smoke, and just any general air sealing material. So this product has officially been in the market for about two years. Um, Mandalay Homes was the first production builder to adopt this technology in every home that they build. They, uh, a couple months ago, surpassed 3,000 homes being built with the aerosol air sealing technology. Um, the biggest reason that they chose to go with the, the technology is because they needed a consistent air, they needed a consistent um, air leakage target. They use closed cell foam and continue to use closed cell foam on all of their houses. Um, I'm sorry, they use open cell foam, foam on all of their houses and they continue to do that with aero barrier. The challenge was they were getting a pretty significant delta in final blower door test from one house to the next based on how that foam was applied. The one thing that they were trying to do was make solar feasible on a production scale. And by being able to get them a consistent air, air leakage, they could reduce the amount of solar needed to get to near net zero um, with solar being included in all their projects. So you can see in the graphic, a code built home at three air changes per hour in their marketplace was going to require 16 kilowatts of solar, which is roughly 60 solar panels. The standard Mandalay home before aero barrier was instituted was about 1.4 ACH, so that was 7.5 kilowatts or 30 solar panels. By being able to reduce their air leakage, and Mandalay takes their homes sub 0 0.6 ACH 50 on every house they build. But for a baseline of 0.6 ACH, that got them to 3.5 kilowatts of solar needed um, in 10 panels. 
So again, you go from 60 to 30 to 10 panels, that makes solar economically feasible on a production scale. And I just want to be clear, Aero Barrier is not the sole reason that they were able to do this. Aero Barrier was really the catalyst that allowed them to do it. Um, th being able to air seal your, your units to this level allowed Mandalay to bring in a battery solution and a solar solution that made sense for those houses um, and allowed them to now offer and put solar and battery into their houses and every house they build um, going forward. So they just started their first development with this new product and every house in that, in that development will get solar and battery. And it's really because their ability to dial in an air leakage or an air leakage target that they are able to achieve this type of scale. So this type of technology can be used from rough end all the way to a completely finished structure. Um, obviously, from an economic standpoint, uh, rough end or first coat of drywall mud is the most economical time to apply but it can be used um, at other times. We are actually working with the DOE now, and we were given a grant that will start in the spring where we will be sealing uh, finished houses. We'll be, fin we'll be sealing um, houses that are already in the marketplace, either at tenant turnover or at when someone buys and sells a house. So the technology is flexible in the sense that it can be used in any structure as long as that structure can be pressurized. Once pressurization of up to 50 pascals can be achieved, the technology, we can air seal pretty much any structure after that point. So one of the projects that we did that um, was more of a finished space was this project here. Um, it was a semi-finished passive house apartment project that is in um, Manhattan in New York City. All of these 38 units were finished. Um, none of them could pass the compartmentalization level test required for passive house. Um, the builder and developer decided that they were going to rip out some drywall, rip out some carpet, hand seal some units, and then retest. Um, after that manual work and, and the cost that was associated with it, they still weren't able to really get the results that they needed to, to certify at passive house levels. <coughs> Excuse me. At that point, they brought in the technology and uh, we were able to do all 38 units in six days um, and all units were then certified passive house level for compartmentalization and they were able to get the occupancy permit and certification that they were looking for. So again, the technology is really great for new construction as it's installed or as it's integrated into the build process and that's really the preferred point of application. But if there are projects that maybe aren't meeting the standard required, the technology can still be used. And like I said earlier, we are exploring opportunities and we have done work um, throughout the U.S. with already um, lived in or, you know, the retrofit market that we have in the U.S. today. Um, and we're working to seal those. Um, and then the other DOE project that we did was really, um, it was a culmination of about two years of work where we tested the aerosol, aer 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 aerosol sealing approach in the new construction marketplace and tried to understand if you were going to use this technology, what could be removed from the build process? How does that impact timing? How does that impact build cycle? And just what, are, what were the overall impacts of bringing aerosol air sealing into the build environment? So we have some reports from the DOE and from our third party partner that did the research. Um, if that's something of interest, we can help you get those reports. But at the end of the day, it, the, the reports resulted in a 73% tighter house than baseline homes, 79% um, average leakage reduction through use of the technology, and a 56% greater building tightness using aerosols versus open cell spray foam. So there's a lot of benefits um, to, to instituting this type of technology. There's other things in the build process that also could be removed. But that's really based on how the structure is being built and what products are being used. So we went through a lot of, a lot of information in a very short amount of time based on the technology and, and really why it's important to the build environment and in particular high performance homes. Um, you know, one of the things that we are really proud about 
is Vast Company recognized this technology as a world-changing idea. And it's one thing to be recognized, you know, in the construction industry for something that you think is going to change the industry. It's another thing to be recognized by someone outside the industry that sees the technology and in, in a meaningful way that can change the world as we know it. And, you know, at the end of the day, our belief is that every person is, um, should be able to have a high performing home. Um, it shouldn't be a, a status symbol or, or coveted by those who have the money to spend on it. It should just be a standard of how we build our buildings. Um, and we believe that aerosol sealing is going to offer builders and developers a more cost effective and streamlined approach to tightening the building envelope in turn, allowing them to build higher performing homes for everybody, not just for those that can pay for it. And that's another reason that we're pursuing the avenue of of sealing um, existing structures. I again, it's it's just one of those things that everybody should have a home that performs as you would expect. When you buy a house, the expectation is not, not that you're buying a house with holes in it. If you told the, the consumer that at three ACH, you have X number of holes in your house, maybe to the size of an open window, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, they probably wouldn't buy that product. Unfortunately, that's what we're left with today. And we believe that providing a more streamlined, cost-effective approach to air sealing the building envelope, that we can bring it to the masses and, and offer a better built environment for everybody, that, that it, and it's something that they deserve. So I'll, I'll jump off my soapbox there and see if there's any questions out of the, out of the attendees. 